Messed up life uh, doesn't exactly capture it completely. Like you had definitely had uh, your moments where things were a little dark and you went down some some tough roads. I mean, that's part of what's really interesting about your story is that like, I think people get to the point where you were and feel like it's over. Like they are screwed right. and they can never turn it around. How did you well, go Well, it doesn't help that story? when you get down to that point, everybody around you tells you you can't. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so uh, That's awful. I just uh, crawled into an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting as beat up and broken as you would imagine you'd be. And they said, pray. I said, to what? And that was the journey. It was, okay, if God exists, then what does that look like? Yeah. Or is it true? And uh, I went through, I never read a book in my entire life, and all of a sudden I became this vociferous reader. I mean, I just read everything I could get my hands on to try to find some point to anything. And, um, you know, after seven or eight years, I met some guy on the road. He put the Bible in my hands of all the books. I, I tell people all the time, the bookstores are full of thousands of books of man's attempt to find meaning apart from God. Mm. And the Bible hasn't changed in 2,000 years. You know, it just sits there with dust all over it. And, and uh, it was the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, the, the first verse says, meaningless, meaningless, all in life is meaningless. And I said, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're speaking I mean, directly it was. to me. My wife was leaving me. I, had, I mean, it was, just, it was just the perfect time to hear that. And I, to me, that was such a deep, profound truth. I was a nihilist at that point. Yeah. And uh, when a nihilist hears it's, it's all a waste of time, you go, yes, it is. And then uh, later on in the chapter, uh, Solomon talks about um, the uh, eyes never get enough of seeing, the ears never get enough of hearing. In other words, you'll never see enough or hear enough to satisfy and sate whatever that is inside of us. So uh, I'm looking at my video library, my audio library, and going, that's true. So I felt if, if that stuff was true, then other things in it must be true. Yep. And, and eventually I just got to Christ and the cross and thought, okay, I'm, I'm yours if it's true then it will last. If it's not, then it'll just be another one of many. I mean, I tried Buddhism. I, you, <laughs> I wanted to raise the kids <laughs> Buddhist. I came home one day and I, you know, I had a reason. Tammy goes, I said, I'm, raised, I'm putting the kids in a Buddhist monastery. She says, over my dead body. And I went, oh, okay. That's how long it took her to talk me <laughs> out of it. But I said, I said, look, I'm a rage freak. My brother was a rage mm -hmm. freak. My dad was a rage freak. I got two boys. I don't want them to be like me. Yeah. And when's the last time you heard about a Buddhist rage, road rage incident? You know, <laughs> it's, they're not exactly out there, you know, yeah. running their cars into, right. into stores yeah. you know, because they're irritated. So mm -hmm. anyway, I had You don't a see a lot of Buddhist monks driving at all. Not at really. all. Really? It's just not their thing. Doing a whole lot. Um, so uh, take people back to how you got to this low point, because you were part of like the stand up comedy revolution. Like you were right in the middle of. Yeah, I started at 78. So by 1980, there were more clubs than there were comedians. And I yeah. always said I got a chance to go out and be bad at something and make a few bucks. Right. Until I learned some craft. But yeah, I was living in Boston, which in the 80s. Outside of maybe San Francisco was the hottest place in the country Huge. to do comedy. Mm -hmm. And I was really blessed and fortunate. I mean, you could do five shows in one club on a Saturday night. They had a huge room upstairs, about 400 people. And then downstairs, they sat about 250. It would Jeez. just go up and down the stairs to, to, to work. And uh, one of the stories I tell in the book was I got, I got out in the car. I was doing some cocaine for the ride home and some cop raps on the window and pulls me out and cuffs me and they're putting me in a cruiser and a policeman off duty who was working security at the club looks at me and goes, oh, what's, what are you doing with him? He goes, oh, I was doing cocaine. And the off duty cop goes, oh, let him go. He's one of the comedians as if that's a get out of jail. Wow. <laughs> so anyway, it turned out it was. Wow. They took me out, uncuffed me and the cop looked at me and said, you, are, you have no idea how lucky you are. The DA is up for reelection. And they love nothing more than parading white suburban boys in front of the camera right before the election. Mm. So anyway, uh, that was like one of the, uh, and then I was driving the wrong way on the interstate one night so drunk, you know. And, ah, scary. And then I, I, went, I went after my six-month-old son one night. He was crying, and I spanked him. And um, Tammy took him away from me and sat on the end of the bed and fed him. And that was, that was it for me. That was the, the most humiliating thing I could think of ever doing. Yeah. I mean, uh, so anyway, I told her, you don't take me to this, this meeting tomorrow. I'm not going to go. And if I don't go, I don't think we're going to make it. So she took me to AA and that started the whole thing, man. It was just this uh, thing about seven or eight years of just constantly going, you know, what's the, what's it all? What's the point? You know, they'd say higher power. And I go, look, if I'm making up a deity, that makes me delusional. I mean, 
it's a nice fuzzy thing, you know, like a bumper sticker, you sure. know, until life happens. You get death of a child, the loss of a job, cancer or something, and you're on your knees trying to find some comfort and your brain's chirping at you. What are you who are you talking to? Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's not real. So anyway, that was, yeah. you know, that was it. I think it's like portrayed a lot of times, you know, a lot, the, the story of, of, of a dark, dark place and a turnaround even through God is, is a story that people have gone through. Obviously, this is a big part of the, of, of the church and, and why people go to it. But like it's often presented as this like moment, right, where you you go from dark to light. Yeah, and now I'm fixed. Yeah, and now that's I'm not fixed. even close. It's not. You, so no. this took a lot of work after and you I'm had still, this. And still, I mean, believe me, the uh, the Bible's clear. Paul talks about it. The, we have old nature, and we and then you you say to I want the Holy Spirit, whatever. Yeah, that's your new nature. So you got this thing warring. I mean, and believe me, I I'm I'm not holding myself up. I don't yeah. I don't want the NSA going through my, <laughs> my stuff. Man. You know, yeah. I'm I'm telling you, I have a major work in progress. Sure. And I said I have to be careful now mm. because of all the exposure that I've been getting online and stuff. Now right. people are recognizing me. So yeah. I told my wife, now I can't even throw a fit at the airport because <laughs> I'll I'll go viral. Right. Christian comedian. Yeah. That's why it was funny. We mm-hmm. every time we would watch. Um, uh, survivor. Mm-hmm. Tammy says, "Oh, you'd be perfect. I can yeah. see it. You know, two <laughs> days without food, your blood sugar drops. And now you're choking other. Con- and That's right below it, it says Christian comedian. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Jeff Allen. Jeff Allen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's funny because that 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 uh, that journey for a lot of people like has so many ups and downs. It's not even a smooth. Not at all. You know, and I think like I, mean, I think about this in in in." in uh, politics. I know how closely yeah. you follow politics, too. And, you know, the, in the country, it's not like this straight line story of freedom, right? Like the world as it is right. errs towards the side of despotism and authoritarianism, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Just like we naturally sort of err toward the side of, of being terrible human beings. <laughs> right. Um, and if you're not constantly trying to bring yourself back to the Bible or from a political sense, the Constitution, you can get lost really quickly. Well, I have five questions I put in the book that I, I visit at least monthly in my life really? as an assessment. Okay. Um, what defines me? Most men will give you a vocation. Mm-hmm. Um, and if that's the case, then you're basically a victim to your circumstances. You could lose your job, you lose your vocation, you lose your meaning and your point and mm-hmm. compass to life. Um, so what defines me is, uh, you know, Sartre, uh, before he died, um, came to a conclusion. He said that his his... His philosophy was unlivable, existentialism. Mm-hmm. Um, he said in order for something finite to have meaning, it has to be attached to something infinite and fixed. Now, he would never say God. He was an atheist, but mm-hmm. that sounds like God. So anyway, sure does. so what defines me, uh, what do I value? Um, I used to look around and wish I had stuff, uh, things, material, and uh, I want to be a man of integrity. I really do. I want to integrate what I believe with how I live. Mm-hmm. And that's the struggle because there's, uh, without a standard, then you're, ju- you're you are an existentialist. You're just you know following your passions, right. and that got me to the gutter. Uh, what are my expectations? Um, you know, that I tell my wife all the time, if you would lower your expectations of me, I would meet them, and you'd be a lot happier. <laughs> right. and this you know, is your fault, right? Right. Yeah. But expectations very important. What voices do you listen to? You know this. Yeah. It's a very noisy culture. Mm-hmm. So what you choose to put in, your, your mind and your heart, it will come out at some point. So pay attention to the voices you listen to. I still, to this day, I, we have friends that watch CNN and MSNBC. And I, I mean, I sat down with them, tried to have a serious conversation with them. I said, two years they perpetuated a lie about Trump. Hmm. Two years, night after night. This doesn't bother you. This doesn't force you to at least Re-examine your exactly. viewing choices. The credibility of <laughs> yeah, the information yeah. you're getting. You mm. know? So anyway, what voices do you listen to? And then where does your hope lie? Mm. Um, if your hope is in the next election, I feel sorry for you. Yeah, yeah. No I kidding. really do. No kidding. And, um, and, uh, and again, I, I, I read, wrapped up in the 90s. I talked to Glenn about this. I said I was never more miserable in my life. You know? And I, I was working with a guy. I tell this story in the book. I'm working with a guy in an AA thing. And he says, uh, I said, I'm so miserable, man this sobriety thing, and he goes, how much news do you watch? And this was before Fox. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, not much, six, seven, eight hours a day. <laughs> I, mean, I was just <laughs> yeah, out in the hotel room. Yeah. It was CNN, headline news. Yeah. And he said, uh, he was in uh, South America, the Pope was there. And uh, you know, he's backslidden Catholic. He says, well, who doesn't want to see the Pope? So anyway, he goes out, sure. quarter of a million people. One time the Pope says, let's get on our knees and pray. He said, 
most profound experience I've ever had, certainly in a religious sense. Mm. He said something washed over that entire place. So I go back to my room that night and CNN covered the 15 protesters that were calling the Pope the Antichrist. <laughs> and he sure, said, I realize yeah, the camera is just that big. It's yeah. myopic. And mm -hmm. whatever that news director chooses, and you got a paradigm that's 24 seven, if it bleeds, it leads. So what can go wrong with pumping that into your soul seven nights a week, you know? Yeah. So it takes some time. You know, I, I try to tell my grandchildren, I go, you live in the greatest time in the world. I mean, the internet, you can bring in lectures from some of the greatest minds that God has ever produced. Or you can just sit and play, you know, Animal Farm or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know? No, it's true. I mean, you, I, I... you have the choice to sit down and edify and, and, and fill your soul with something that may benefit yourself and mankind, consequently mankind, you hope. I see it with Glenn. I mean, Glenn, you know, obviously he's been sober for a long time, but like he, he has those battles with the news where he gets so into those worlds of, right. it's just darkness, right? And he, yeah. I, he struggles, I think, to stay on top of it. When, I, when, we, when we had dinner one night, I said to him, I go, what was it like at Fox when you kick over a rock? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you know? that's what it seemed to me. Yeah. As a viewer, I had just heard of him, and yeah. I'm watching this, and like every night we would sit down, and it was like, holy cow. Yeah. You know, I did, and then it leads here, and it's like, oh, it's, it's been going on, all these tentacles. And you can get in it. Uh, I got into it with apologetics for, for my faith. I wanted to learn sure. how to defend my faith. Mm -hmm. And a pastor saw me reading, uh, I think it was a Ravi Zacharias book, and he said, uh, you like that? I go, I, I, yeah, I, f I feel the need in the world I'm in, the secular world, mm -hmm. you know, you should have an answer. Yeah. You know? And he said, be careful. I, he goes, I went down that rabbit hole for 19 years. And uh, he said, there's always questions. He said, in the end, it's really a leap of faith. I mm. mean, you, at some point, you're going to have to just accept the fact that you don't know everything. Mm. And um, it was about three years after that it hit me. I mean, I was on my 37th book, and I'm going, I'm, it's just getting circular. Yeah. It's just this constant thing back, you know, so... So you're a quick learner. It only took you three years after that moment to, to pick it up. <laughs> to pick up the fact that yeah. I'm never going to know. Right. I, I, you know, that's, yeah. I, I said to a friend of mine that's an atheist, I said, why don't you shoot for agnosticism? You know you don't know. How right? about that? Yeah, yeah. there you go. Just, well, good agree. Yeah, yeah, like, just yeah, go there. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know. Um, well, look, your journey's really been uh, one I know has inspired a lot of people. And uh, you know, the book is, is there for people who are maybe going through this or just want to be entertained because, of course, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, and it, it is, I believe that uh, it's, I wrote it for 30-somethings, millennials. Um, mm. uh, I'm working right now with a pastor here to bring Ecclesiastes to my Facebook page uh, because I think it's so relevant uh, you get to be 30 to 40 years old you got the wife you got the house you got the car you got all this and that was what I went through because you know people go why are you so miserable I go I don't know I checked the boxes I had a beautiful yeah. wife I had healthy children job I loved you know and you know we were struggling financially but that was because I was spending more than I was bringing in mm -hmm. to try to salve this wounds so anyway um, uh, there's an answer to all of this, but um, it's um, it, it takes thought, it takes an effort. Um, what it's uh, Aristotle, no, it's Socrates said it: unexamined life is not worth living. You know, and I almost called it an examined life mm. because that was a, a period of my life that was I was just constantly. So the negative side of that is that you're never available for your family because you're constantly in your head. In your own head, yeah. You know, and she's shaking me. You know, we're losing the house. You don't care. I go, I don't. She goes, who says that? I go, someone who doesn't care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I go, yeah. I want to care. Yeah. I just didn't know why it mattered. Ah, wow, yeah. it's an incredible journey. Are we there yet? My journey from messed up to meaningful life. It's from Jeff Allen, available now wherever you get your books. Make sure to pick up a copy today. Jeff, thanks so much. Great to see you, man. Thanks, man. Yeah.